Good evening, everyone. Um, before we start, I've just got to share uh, something with you. Um, when it comes to talking, um, I generally tend to go off topic and meander. Um, you know, start off one place, end up somewhere else, which can be a little unsettling for the listener. So please excuse me for, in case of this, um, in the case of this, um, you know, just to give some format and structure to this discussion with Suresh, I will be reading out from my notes. So yes, it's, it's really a pleasure um, being here in conversation with Suresh about, on his new book. And uh, just like uh, Asha said, it's a very personal pleasure because I, I was really a cricket fan, used to play back in Mount Carmel's, back, back, back in the day. And, um, and then, you know, all the hype and the, the hysteria surrounding the sport really put me off and put me off big time. So I just wouldn't watch, I wouldn't read. And it was just one gentleman, his columns first in the Indian Express, then in the Hindu, which brought me back to the fold uh, of reading at least about cricket, if not actually gone back to watching. So yes, thank you, Suresh. Um, in Why Don't You Write Something I Might Read, Suresh turns his gaze on literature, the craft of writing, good writers, bad writers, bad sex writing, and the inescapable fact like how there can be no more fundamental reason for reading than pure, sheer enjoyment, and how it is difficult to be subjective about writers who have provided hours of joy to the reader. With this book, Suresh has ticked off two of the big boxes that publishers are usually very concerned about. One is a striking jacket illustration, in case you haven't seen it. And the other is a title that conveys a simple twin barreled message. Pick me up. I've got stuff in here that's going to be both engaging and informative. The very Instagrammable illustration is a sculpture titled In Thought, created by Suresh's wife, Dimpi, who is a well-known name amongst art collectors across India. The Intriguing title has an interesting backstory. Suresh, would you tell us how you chanced upon the title? First of all, hello. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for coming this evening. It's always good fun to see people who come for a book reading. It's that crowd is getting increasingly smaller. So I'm very pleased to see that. So many of you have, have turned up today. Uh, yes, the, the, the title of the book, uh, with due apologies to my wife, because uh, what has happened is, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, reviews of the book have focused on the fact that my wife is not a great cricket fan. And somehow, the reviewers are very upset that uh, uh, I write cricket but my wife doesn't read cricket. And rather than leave it between the two of us, you know, they, they have been sort of criticize, criticizing her for not following cricket rather than me for writing this book. In any case, the, the, the line comes from my wife, needless to say. Over the years, I've written a few cricket books. Uh, and uh, whenever I have asked her, why, why haven't you, did you, have you read this book or have you read I think this part of the book you should read. I think this is nice. I enjoyed this, do you think? And, and my wife was not a great cricket fan, which makes her one of, the, one of those rare Indians. Uh, she watches cricket occasionally with me, but uh, not, not uh, unless I hold a gun to her head. So, so her, her, her kind of standard response to all this was, why don't you write something I might read? And I thought that's a rather good title for a book which is not on cricket. So I have to thank, I have to thank Dimpy, my wife, for the title and for the, for the cover uh, picture. The, it's a sculpture of hers called In Thought. And uh, there, there's something, uh, I mean, despite all that, despite her contributions to this, the fact remains that she still doesn't follow cricket and will have to simply live with it. 
You hear this a lot, right? <laughs> okay, so the book's tag like, tagline reads, Reading, Writing, and Arrhythmia. The first and second topics form the backbone of the book. Arrhythmia is discussed in a chapter titled Metaphors and Illness, and one famous sufferer, William Butler Yeats, is named. Why Arrhythmia, Suresh? Why not insanity, alcoholism, syphilis, epilepsy, you know, all the other diseases that plague famous writers? No, it's it, it just, it just me trying to be cute. Rather than saying reading, writing, arithmetic, I just said reading, writing, rhythmia, which I hoped would, would, uh, would be intriguing enough, just as, as you said, uh, just as you thought the cover would be intriguing enough for people to pick up the book, and I'm hoping that this is one book which will be judged by its cover. It's done the trick anyway. Uh, I'd like to know next, what was behind your choice of the writers you write about in the book? It's a very eclectic mix. We have Agatha Christie, we have P.G. Wodehouse, Tom Wolfe, Marquez, Lacare, Muriel Spark, Nadim Aslam. And then, alongside, we also have Clive James, Dante, Ved Mehta, Eduardo Galliano, Martin Gardner, Alberto Manguel, Jenny Erpenbeck, and others. Were you telling readers about authors they may not have heard of, or were you expounding on your admiration for these writers? I think I was just showing off. No, the fact, the fact is that uh, these, these are uh, writers I have read, and, and uh, a lot of them are writers I have read at a very early age, and, uh, and enjoyed through, through the many years. And also the fact is that uh, many of them have, have I, I have rather a, a personal relationship with many of them, which I'd, which I'd uh, also written about. I mean, someone like Naipaul, for example, uh, you know, we've, we've had many meetings and we've sort of uh, somehow kept in touch, not kept in touch, you know, one of those things. And, and also, I've also written about many writers, contemporary writers whom, whom I enjoy very much, like Pico Ayer, and how, how I got Pico Ayer to actually write her. So that makes for really droll reading. Can you, uh, would you like to tell us about it or maybe read out from that uh, chapter? What, what I was thinking of doing was maybe I'll read, yeah, maybe I'll read a bit about the, the, the Naipaul bit or, yeah, fine. Or, or shall I just read from the preface which gives a rather good, uh, I think, idea of what the book is yeah. about. Right. Uh, the birth of the reader, wrote Roland Barth, must be ransomed by the death of the writer. That is the only time you will see that name in this book, or the names of Adorno or Spivak or Derrida. Nothing personal. In fact, literary theorists can be fascinating, even when you understand what they are trying to say. What they often do, however, is make us long for what Terry Eagleton has called a uh, pre-theoretical innocence. There is no bridge across the literary theorist and the average reader that can be crossed without something giving way. The reader who picks up a book because he hopes to enjoy it is not fussed about structure and style, theory or counter theory. Literary writers occasionally write on their passion for sport. Hence Joyce Carroll Oates on boxing, Nabokov on chess, Stephen Jay Gold on baseball, John Updike on golf, Ramachandra Guha on cricket. The traffic is seldom in the other direction. This book is a small attempt to redress that, a sports writer writing on a passion for literature. At 22, I became a, 21 actually, I became a journalist, a sports journalist because a sports editor invited me to be one during a rain break in a cricket league match both of us were playing in. Soon, I realized that the great Indian novel would have to be written by someone else. I was enjoying my job as a sports reporter too much to break away. If you have literary ambitions, avoid journalism. <laughs> Years later, I met V.S. Naipaul and made a joke about hack writing. It upset him. Don't look down on journalism, he said. It is a very special skill. Some great novelists would make terrible journalists. Then I read an essay by Marquez where he called journalism the best job in the world and said, I am basically a journalist. Well, if it's good enough for Naipaul and Marquez, 
Much of this collection was written during the COVID-19 pandemic and may be read in any order you wish. Perhaps not too many on the same day, as we don't know yet what the normal dose might be. So there's a priceless chapter in the book which takes apart the myth of Paulo Coelho as a writer-philosopher, which totally resonated with me. Uh, would you read what he has written on the process of writing, which you state is impossible to parody? I think it's page 28. And would you tell us what you think about the buzz surrounding this uh, best-selling author? Uh, I'll just start in the middle. Coelho, already the world's most successful writer, once told us about the process of writing. It is impossible to parody it. He said, the first stage is plowing the field. As soon as the soil is turned over, oxygen penetrates into places it could not previously reach. We will thus be prepared for the miracle of inspiration. Next comes the sowing. Every work is the fruit of contact with life. The creative person cannot shut himself away. He needs to be in touch with his fellow human beings. He must allow life to sow the fertile ground of his unconscious. I, I find all this extremely uh, provocative in the sense that it is totally meaningless and it sounds a lot like what you'd expect him to write. I've said, Kolo is the master of the falsely profound or the apparently insightful or the spaciously perceptive. He writes like a series of get well cards, his philosophy packed into such nuggets as, it is the simple things in life that are the most extraordinary. Only wise men are able to understand them. He is a bestseller in 155 countries, maybe more since I wrote that. Astronomers wonder if all the talk about Mars getting closer to Earth isn't merely the tangerine covers of such Coelho books as The Alchemist, and 11 minutes being shifted into outer space for readers there. Anything is possible with Coelho. Uh, the Alchemist has sold over 20 gazillion copies or something, or was it 30 gazillion? It doesn't matter, for wisdom is the province of the aged, but the heart of a golden child is pure. That isn't Coelho, but Peter Sellers in The Party. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference. <laughs> but, okay, ouch. But the thing is that somewhere you have redressed the balance, haven't you, near the end of uh, this chapter? No, I, I think he's written one, one good book, or one good by comparison book, which is Veronica Decides to Die. And I've also said that Coelho himself is far more interesting than his books. At 17, he told his parents he wanted to be a writer. Horrified, they put him in an asylum. Wise parents. <laughs> He underwent electroconclusive therapy. By the time he was 20, he had been sent back to the asylum twice more. He escaped both times. He traveled around the country with a guitar, returning home when he ran out of money. He didn't hold the asylum experience against his parents. He felt it was a way of protecting him as an artist when the military dictatorship in Brazil was kidnapping, torturing, and imprisoning left-wing artists and intellectuals in the country. He used these experiences 30 years later in Veronica Decides to Die, a book which helped change Brazilian law. It is not so easy to put someone in, a, in an asylum now. I, I have a problem with this concept of Coelho trying to pass himself off as a spiritualist right. and, and uh, encouraged by a whole lot of reviewers and writers from across the world. So this little para sort of captures this, this whole business for me. Uh, I said, what happens when the spiritualist turns to sex? Eleven minutes happens. Much humor here of the unintended variety. Uh, here's a favorite of mine. We got up and I saw that he hadn't even taken off his trousers. He was dressed just as, as I had found him, only with his penis exposed. I put my jacket over his bare shoulders. We went into the kitchen. He made some coffee. He smoked two cigarettes. I smoked one. Fine, but what became of the penis? So that's a double ouch. <laughs> okay, so in the chapter on translation, Suresh, you say translation is a service, often shining a light on the hidden aspects of a novel. How does this sit with the cardinal rule of fidelity to the original text? Is there a Lakshman Rekha translators must not cross when doing their job, or can they steal across that line? 
I think there are two schools which are, which are equally strong, equally, po equally powerful. One which says that, you know, fidelity to the text is everything. And the other which says that the whole idea of translation is to, is to get the story across, is to get the, the writer's intention across. I think uh, Borges told his translator, or was it Marquez, one of them said, please make me sound better than the original. And Marquez often claimed that the English version of uh, uh, 100 Years of Solitude was much better than his uh, Spanish original. I, I think he was being kind, I don't know. But, but the fact is that translation has to be seen from a, from a perspective of, uh, I, I personally think that any, any book can be translated any number of times, which means that there is no, there is no sort of authorized version of a translation. You cannot have a, tra you cannot have a final translation. Uh, you, give, you give a book to translate, you, you give the book to half a dozen translators and you will get half a dozen translations. Each of them equally interesting, each of them equally uh, sticking with the, with the, you know, going with the fidelity to the original uh, theory. But, but the fact that, just the, just the fact that it can be done, it, that so many people can uh, translate in so many different ways, means that uh, the whole idea of word for word translation it's just not, it just does not uh, make sense. Somewhere, somewhere Umberto Eco has said, for example, I think he's written a, a book called Rat or Mouse. And, and the word in Italian for rat and mouse is the same. And, but it's, but it's, it's, it's uh, the, the difference in the English language is very subtle. For example, if you said that somebody saw a mouse in the street, or uh, it, it, it can be a playful thing, but if you said, uh, there was a rat there. It could presage the plague. It could, it could, you know, it, it means a whole lot of other things. So not only are you translating the words, not only are you translating the expressions, not, it's, it's a cultural thing. You have, to, you do have to get the translation of the, of the, of the concept right. And uh, the best translators are those who, who can do that. I mean, if you read, if you read about how Rabasa translated uh, 100 Years of Solitude and how he, he arrived at just the title alone, which is, which is quite distant from what Marquez had written originally in Spain. But 100 Years of Solitude is a, is a, is a, is a, is a title that gets you immediately. Uh, we can't think of it. Yeah, yeah and, and, and you think that's, yeah, exactly. So, so, so the, the, the whole idea of translation, I think, uh, rests on how, how, well it, how well it captures the reader. And I think that's, that's really important. So you write about the writer's disease, alcoholism, almost like it is an inevitable byproduct. Would you care to read from that chapter? I, I'll tell you about it. Okay. <laughs> I think, I think uh, when, I, when I was very young and I wanted to become this, uh, this great uh, Nobel winning writer, uh, I thought one of the important things, one of the important ingredients of being a writer apart from you know, being able to write well, was that you had to be an alcoholic. Because all, all the writers I admired those days, the, the Hemingways, the Faulkners, all, all of them were al alcoholics. And in fact, at one time, uh, almost the entire lot of Nobel winners from, from America were all terrible alcoholics. And many of them, uh, I mean, Hemingway, for example, killed himself. So there, there, there's, a, there's a, I mean, that, that part of it somehow didn't enter my you know, consciousness so much. The idea that you, that you, that you had to drink in able to produce, you know, uh, literature. For, for some reason, I, I, I'm not even sure why, uh, settled in my mind when I was very young. And uh, it doesn't work. I tried it. It doesn't work. I mean, and I tried it when I was very young. <laughs> but but the, the, point, the point about uh, alcoholism is that, uh, like journalists say now, I mean, or at least they used to when, when I started out in that, they used to say they had to smoke well, you know, to be able to write a, a good report, which is nonsense. I mean, you don't have to smoke to write a good report. You don't have to drink to write a good novel. But these are ideas, these, these were cliches in my time. And I think now increasingly uh, that aspect of it has gone out of writing. Because that was fueled largely by Hollywood. That was fueled largely by Hollywood. No, but that was also largely fueled by the fact that so many Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winners were... Were, 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 uh, yeah, alcoholics. I mean, <laughs> William, William Faulkner was, was so drunk when he went to receive his Nobel Prize that, that he, nearly, he nearly grabbed the uh, king of Norway or whatever and, and, and toppled with him. So it's, it's, it's a, it was a serious problem. I mean, ultimately, Hemingway shot himself. So 
there was a serious issue, and a couple of the books I discussed there, which, uh, which talk about this, uh, give a very clear and, and, and uh, uh, I was going to say simple, but I mean, these things aren't simple, but a uh, very clear picture of, of uh, alcoholism. And, and there was also, uh, so only why only male writers? Why not female writers? And that's, that's not entirely true. Maybe the numbers of female writers who, who, who are alcoholic are not uh, as many, in, as, as great, but uh, there have been significant female uh, alcoholics who, 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 who wrote. That's interesting because um, we, we don't really read much about them. That is true. That is true. We don't, and I, I don't know if that has to do with just politeness, so I have no idea. Some sort of a reverse sexism, I don't know. So, okay, uh, this is my sports question. Sports is important, uh, Suresh says in the book, both to enhance life and to get over death. Please expand on that line of thought, um, especially the latter part of that sentence. Oh, well, say that again? You know, you've uh, said that a sport is important both to enhance life and get over death. Ah, yes. Uh, I said to enhance life because you, you can... There are moments in, in sport that, that you know, I mean, like, like good poetry or, or a good, good work of art or, or good music. Uh, watching, watching, I don't know, Lionel Messi, Messi play or, or, or maybe Virat Kohli when he could bat, you know, it, it sort of raised your uh, level of sheer pleasure. And I think, I think that's, uh, it's an important uh, uh, part of that. And, and the point of and point of defying death is not so much uh, literal in the sense of defying death, but in in that moment you're alive, and when you're fully alive, uh, you know death is not a part of your consciousness at all. Um, I'm curious about one thing: was there much editorial intervention for this book? Did your editor suggest cuts and tweaks and a revision of the list of authors, um, or were you pretty much left alone to write and? I, I, I was very lucky in that uh, I had as editor V.K. Karthika, who's one of the great uh, publishers, editors in the country. Uh, from the moment that uh, she had this idea in her head and, and we spoke about it, and I don't think, personally, I don't think any other editor in the country would have uh, gone for a book like this for, for, for two reasons. One is that essays are not very popular. Essays are not something that publishers think can sell. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. And, and the other being that literary essays, I mean, you're writing about Cyril Connolly, you're writing about Evelyn Waugh, who are these people? You know, why should I read about these people? You know, that's, that's, that's a kind of mentality. So I was, I was very lucky that uh, it started with Karthika, and Karthika, uh, not only was she, uh, uh, not only did she commission me to write it, she also uh, edited, she was also my line editor. And uh, we had a few back and forth, but no, there was no, there was no serious. Uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to think that this is one of those cases where the editor actually enjoyed what the writer was writing, so we didn't have too many arguments. That's wonderful, actually. So you talk of the bridge between the literary theorist and the average reader, the bridge that cannot be crossed without something giving away. So here we have you, a sports writer turned literary theorist, and what I'd like to know, and I dare say everyone else, even if not the nation, would like to know, is how firmly was the image of the average reader, uh, you know, with their fabled short attention span, uh, fixed in your mind when you were writing this book? Did you consciously, I hesitate to use the word simplify, uh, make, you know, um, the work reader friendly? Speed up your pace. No, nothing, nothing like that. I, I, this is a very personal book. It's not. It's not. Uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, and I mean, if you quote me, I'll deny it. But uh, the fact is, I wrote this book for myself, not really for a reader. In that sense, I didn't have a picture of a reader. I didn't have. I didn't think uh, of consciously, uh, you know, writing one way or another to please a reader or the publisher or the market or whatever. It. It didn't. Uh, I mean, th those are thoughts that never occurred to me. Uh, I, I, I saw this as, as uh, writing something that uh, was very, very, as I said, extremely personal to me. And uh, to that extent, uh, the publisher allowed me, allowed me uh, the sort of, uh, <laughs> allowed me to simply go ahead and write what I wanted. It, it never once came up. 
it never once came up no in fact it, in fact i was at 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 one point i was i was saying uh, something like do you think that we should carry this essay on cyril connolly i mean nobody reads cyril connolly nobody knows who cyril connolly is today but uh, it 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 was it was discussing an important book and i think uh, cyril connolly still has relevance today which uh, you know the reader may or may not agree with uh, cyril, cyril connolly was this uh, uh, essayist novelist and writer who wrote a classic called enemies of promise and and listed out uh, a series of uh, i think seven or eight uh, uh problems that uh, writers would have and he was basically exploring how a a, a novel a, a work of fiction would last 10 years and this was written in in 1938 i think and i i came across this book in 1980 or something so he it it obviously it, it worked fine for him so i was i was fascinated by that and and it's a, it's a different it's a different kind of writing it's a different kind of uh, attitude towards writing and uh, i i was a bit hesitant about that one one single essay but uh, uh, i thought it generally fit in with the overall overall uh, sort of uh, it did actually plan so it didn't, yeah. it didn't matter so can we talk about superficial writing recently i watched an interview uh, where karan tapa talks with arun shuri Uh, about how writers now dumb their writings hold back complex and complicated arguments because they feel the reader can't and won't be able to take it all in shuri counters by saying one way to avoid this curse of mediocrity is not to pitch one's writing to the average reader but to aim higher so that one's writing pass master with the expert in the field uh what do you have to say to that as a veteran columnist well i th- i think i'm entirely with shauri there, there are two different things here uh, as a columnist i don't have to dumb it down but as a columnist i have to ensure that a large percentage of people who who read me actually understand me and that's important but as but as a as an author as a as a novelist or a, or a writer of non fiction i i don't think that should matter too much i don't I, in fact it's a cop out i i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend that to anybody to to actually uh try and write uh, write down write down although a lot of a lot of uh, current successful writers are actually writing down anyway without any effort because that comes naturally to them <laughs> no but that's true it is so the chapter title reading suspiciously talks about canceling authors for perceived literary misdemeanors committed years and years ago what do you think about the cancel culture that rages amidst us now swallowing the likes of enid blyton jk rowling chimamanda adichi and uh, i dare say salman rushdi and taslima nasreen earlier before cancel culture became a thing well i i i have an issue with this whole cancel culture business for one for one it 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 makes no sense to me in any case it is short lived and if enid blyton wrote about golly wogs in in 1920 or, or whatever and in 30s i think uh and and we are we're discussing it a hun- nearly 100 years later uh you have to judge a book according to the time in which it was written if if at all you have to judge a book along those lines and and uh, it it is stretching it a bit to to imagine that uh, i mean i i don't know i i have i kept making a joke about this why don't you write something i might i, I might read and maybe you know 50 years from now there might be a, there might be a problem about people who that's assuming this last 50 years there might be a pe- uh, problem with people who think that's no way to talk about your wife in public right. so so cancel culture i think is is you know is a bit much to So Bangaloreans will be especially happy to read the tribute to Premier and Blossom Bookhouse Select and the Bookworm. So these are places barring Premier which of course is sadly closed down that quietly bucks the Cassandra like warning that reading is a dying habit. What does it say of Bangalore and Bangalorean Suresh that such bookshops continue to flourish steadily and without too much PR? I think I think it's wonderful. I think Church Street in Bangalore is the finest book street anywhere in the country and and uh, it's 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 almost unbelievable that uh, you know we we have been blessed with uh, 
what, nine or ten bookstores in, on one street and some of them, you know, the finest, easily the finest in the country. I, and I think, I think there has been a tradition. I think, I think uh, someone like Shan Bagh, who started uh, Premier all those years ago, uh, gave, us, gave us another view of the bookstore. I mean, he, he told us, I mean, without, I mean, he was, he was a very soft-spoken, uh, you know, gentle man who gave us an idea that a bookstore could be far more than just somewhere, some place where you went and picked up your geography textbook or whatever. And he was extremely understanding and gracious and kind, and he developed generations of readers by, by, the, simple, by the simple technique of being polite and kind to young readers. I mean, I, I remember when I first went to Premier, I must have been maybe 11 or 12 years old. And uh, he kept, he kept, he knew, very, very soon he knew the kind of books I wanted. Very soon he knew th my background. He knew, he knew, you know, a lot about me. So that when, when we met and over the years, I mean, I would have known him for well over 40, 45 years. And, and it, it was a continual, a continual growth for the, for the both of us. For him as a, as, a, as, a, as a books person, looking at this youngster who's grown virtually in front of his eyes, and, and for me as someone who, who've always been completely in love with that place, and, and uh, as I said, we, it, it, that was at that time the only place in Bangalore which was like that. A lot of a lot of uh, bookstores treated you like uh, you had come to steal their books. Mm -hmm. They always hovered around. They always wanted to sort of say and 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 very unsubtly they say things like, uh, "Can we help you, sir? Is this what you're looking for, sir? This thing is here, sir." And and on one glorious occasion they said, "No, no, you can't afford that book." <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> and that was that. So it's 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 wonderful that. And I think these these bookstores that I was talking to you about just now, I, I've written about Bookworm and. Blossom and these others uh, are, are, are in that tradition of, of uh, Shanbhag's premiere, which is a wonderful thing. So do you have a favorite um, chapter? Would you like to read from something that you're especially fond of? Well, the, 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 the traditional answer to this is they're all my children and I love them all. Yeah. I, I was hoping for something <laughs> slightly different from you. Uh, let me see. What do you think I should read from? Uh, maybe the Pico Ayer thing, that really was a very interesting. I mean, Pico, not really into sports, but um, Suresh got him to write about cricket. Yeah, uh, as some of you might know, I was uh, the editor, the founding editor of Wisden India, which is a cricket almanac. They used to call it the Bible of cricket, but I, I suppose now you have to call it the Gita of cricket. We, and I, and, and, uh, I was an agenda-driven... Uh, editor, my agenda was to get as many of my favorite writers to write for it as possible. So uh, this is this is how the Pico uh, IR thing happened. We met at the Jaipur Literature Festival at a party thrown by a publisher on the terrace of a ramshackle building, which you reached through a narrow, winding, never-ending staircase. This presumably for the writers from abroad searching for the authentic India experience. It was cold, especially when the wind blew in the wrong direction, but he provided the warmth. For years, I had been a fan of Siddharth Pico Raghavan Iyer, and when I told him that, he bowed with a grace, he bowed with grace as if he were hearing this for the first time. I had just read The Man Within My Head, and if I didn't have an agenda in mind, our conversation would have touched upon the Dalai Lama, Leonard Cohen, Graham Greene, and the places Pico had visited and written about so wonderfully. But those days, all meetings, even with one's heroes, in fact, especially with one's heroes, were agenda-driven. I was editor of Western India Almanac and hoping to attract my favorite writers to contribute. This was a perk of the job, to be able to read my favorite authors writing about my favorite game. Uh, Pico said he might write if he could think of something and if he had the time. I began bugging him soon enough. When I wrote saying he had made a promise to write, he gently reminded me it wasn't so. I seem to remember saying something like, if anyone could ever persuade me to write about cricket, it would be you. No one could be more fun, more persuasive, and more engaging. I so hugely enjoyed our meeting, and yours was among the most literate and thoughtful and charming company I found in the city. It was a promising start, but it was a no. 
gentle, kind, charming, but no, nevertheless. We may have to wait for a more propitious, propitious moment or for a six from the Ashes series to hit me on the head so as to ensure a memorable article. But once that happens, it would be a great honor to contribute to the Cricketer's Bible, especially in the country where cricket is more of a religion than anywhere else in some future year. Editors get rejection letters from writers too, but they don't get to their posts by giving up at the first sign of rejection, however charming. And we have this long-running communication. Um, and finally, Pico writes, uh, inspiration struck quite quickly after our exchange. I'm sure it will be many, many years before anyone displaces you as the champion of gracious, kind, and eloquent solicitations. And if you see anything that looks wrong to you here, let alone any recidivist American spellings, please feel free to correct. Uh, yeah, Pico began his essay thus. <coughs> the great open space between the trees is a perfect elegance of green and white. You can smell the fresh cut grass. The pavilion in one corner, now empty, speaks for near <coughs> vanished world of clapping and tea. The chairs are rearranged in a ceremonial circle as if the conducting of a group discussion in which no one can hear anyone, so everybody speaks very softly. If you are lucky, this is one of the three days the British government allows every year for sunshine. <laughs> and and that's, that's the tenor of the piece, and he, and he carries on. And, and later he wrote to me saying, uh, I, I have only 1,500 words of cricket in my head, and I've given the whole lot to you. <laughs> oh, charming. Now, I have to ask you the ubiquitous question. Does a lit fest really boost sales of a book? Or is it just an ego massage, fun exercise, brief holiday from the humdrum of daily writing? I think it's all of the uh, all of the above. <coughs> <laughs> they they do they do uh, uh, add to the sales, I suppose. Uh, that also depends a lot on your publisher. It also depends a, no, a lot on how much trouble you can create at the festival. <laughs> if you can say provocative things that will get the police to come and sort of uh, guard you or some such. I, I always told these, I always told these uh, people who run uh, lit fests in India, all you have to do is start a rumor that Salman Rushdie is coming and your publicity is assured through <laughs> till, till you actually, uh, you can always say no, he decided not to come at the last minute. Okay, so Suresh has casually, wittily thrown light on several things in this book. What it means to Fauci, how to answer the question, gosh, have you read all your books? And how the poet Aga Shahid Ali defines a good writer. But you'll have to pick up a copy of Why Don't You Write Something I Might Read to know all about that. Suresh, I was plugging for you. <laughs> <laughs> Every bit helps. <laughs> so shall we throw the session open to audience questions? Uh, Suresh, in hindsight, uh, any regrets at all um, that um, you didn't become a literary writer rather than becoming a sports writer? No, none at all. None at all. Because uh, you were pretty well read in college itself and uh, you could have well got into like, you know, the literary side uh, book section or the magazine section or something. Um, how come you chose uh, sports? Of course, you were a cricketer too, uh, but how come you chose sports over literary? Well, actually, you had I, a choice. I, it's, uh, without sounding, I can't say this without sounding pompous, but sports chose me. As I've said here, I mean, we were playing a cricket match, and the sports editor came up to me and said, "Would you? Would you? Wh why don't you come to the office on Monday?" And I came to the office on Monday, and he said, "Are you ready to start work?" I was 20, 21, something, something like that, and I, I, I just, I thought it was a lark. I, I, I thought it was a, it, it was good fun. You know, you, you never took anything so seriously those days, and uh, I actually started enjoying myself. And once I started enjoying myself, there was really no, no looking back. And I, I could, I could always write the other stuff. I have, I have written, you know, books columns. I have written, 
political stuff. Uh, I have written editorials over the years. So it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, the thing is, the thing is, I personally don't see a great difference. Uh, I don't see a great difference in, in uh, uh, writing per se, whether you're writing cricket or, or, I don't know, politics or economics or literature, in that uh, you're, you're using, uh, if, you, if you accept that uh, all writing is about oneself, that all, all, all writing is personal, then the fact is that you're using, you're using the uh, subject merely as a, as a platform for, for expressing your opinions. And that, that worked very well for me. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, when you wrote this book, did you revisit uh, writers and books that you had uh, read maybe at a different stage of your life? And uh, how was that? Yes, yes, I did actually. That was one of the joys of, of uh, getting into this project was that I did go back uh, to read a lot of the uh, old favorites. And I think the, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, as I say somewhere, uh, a lot of the writers with whom you've read and loved when you were younger, uh, in your mind, after a point of time, they, they go beyond criticism. Uh, in, it, to me, I can't, I can't really criticize, let's say, P.G. Woodhouse or G.K. Chesterton or, or a lot of people whom I read when I was, when I was younger because they, they mean a certain thing. They stand for a certain thing. They, they evoke a certain feeling bring back certain memories which uh, uh, and, and I would be diminishing all that if I were to sit and write a, 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 a critical study of, of, of those writers. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but that, that's how it was for me. Well, thanks, uh, Suresh, for that for the amazing book, uh, for opening all of those doors for us uh, to, to a lot of authors that I didn't know. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about process and uh, there's this wonderful TED talk by Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, the person who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she says that, uh, you know, you wait for the genie and you know, you show up at the table every day and then hopefully someday the genie comes and, and then, you know, dispels the magic. Uh, so I want to know what, what your process is like does the genie come off? And it seems like it's very easy that you're always relaxed and the books are just sort of happening by chance while you're traveling or having good food or, you know, or gardening. <laughs> so what's that process like? How, how do you, I mean, what's the discipline of, of the writing life? You, you, you put your finger on the, on the right word, discipline. But I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, David Lowe, the, the famous cartoonist, the New York, uh, the, sorry, Newsweek cartoonist, he, he, he had this wonderful thing to say. He said that, uh, half my job is, is the hard work of drawing the cartoon. The other half of my work is to erase all signs of hard work. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of us can identify with that. No, I think, I think it's just a question of discipline. If, if uh, uh, you, you have a genie coming and visiting you, then you're bloody lucky. I mean, that's, that's uh, I, think, I think that's... Uh, I don't think uh, you know such a thing exists. I think I think especially for uh, people who write a lot, uh, I think it's just a, it's just a question of it's 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 a, it's a discipline, as you said. You 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 get up in the morning, you spend so many hours writing. Sometimes it's nonsense. Sometimes it doesn't you know it doesn't uh, appear anywhere. Sometimes it's just you you just chuck it, but. Every, even every failure takes you that much closer to what you want to write, what, you, what your uh, original concept is in writing. And I think all, all writing, all art actually, as, as you will agree, uh, is also about uh, reducing the, the sort of distance between, between the concept and the execution. And, and the only way to do that is to keep, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it uh, at all times. And that's, that's really the, dis I mean, the word is discipline. The only, only real uh, uh, secret is discipline.
No more questions? I'm, I'm happy to take questions that are not in the syllabus. <laughs> no, so just a quick one, Suresh. So what next? What can we expect from you now? What's your, do you have a project? I love that question. Yeah. Not that I have an answer, but I love the question. Yeah, I, 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 am, I am hoping to do a book. Uh, well, there are, there are two or three things floating around in my mind, but uh, I, am, I am thinking of doing, uh, go, going back to my roots a little bit and doing a book on cricket. And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see how it... Uh, my, my publisher is also keen that I do a book on cricket, and I think that's, uh, that's really where it's going next. I hope. To a large extent, uh, certainly when, when I was starting out as a journalist, to a large extent, sports writers are allowed a certain a certain leeway that is not given to other writers. So we can occasionally, uh, you know, write sort of purple prose, and we can occasionally write terrible puns, and that sort of thing is allowed, which is not allowed for the edit writers or, or for the uh, for the other sections of a newspaper. But I think I think the the part you're talking about uh, writing as, uh, uh, as 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 sports sports writing helping another type of writing. I, I, I don't know if that's really true. I think it's, it may well be the other way around. I mean, some of the, some of the finest books on, on uh, sport, as I've mentioned here, I mean, the finest book on boxing, for example, is written by Joyce Carol Oates. She's a novelist, essayist, and, and she has written a, a slim volume called On Boxing, which I think is the finest book on boxing. Some of the finest uh, uh, sports writing is in boxing. And, and it's, it's maybe, maybe writers who do boxing have a, have a particular uh, way of writing which is different from writers who do soccer or tennis or cricket or whatever. So yeah, to that extent, maybe. But, but I, I'm not very sure that uh, uh, I, there may be a connection, but it may not be in the direction in which you, you've indicated. It may be in the other, uh, the, the flow may be in the other direction. Uh, biographical writing, for instance, uh, biographies or teaming up with an cr ex-cricketer to write his autobiography, like we had Rist Assured by um, Kaushik on GR. Um, there are quite a few cricketers, um, you know, whose autobiographies or biographies haven't yet been written. And um, there is a market for it, there's a readership for it because, you know, cricket crazy country, everybody loves to read um, their uh, life story. Um, haven't you tried any of these uh, present? Well, I mean, I've, written, I've written a book on Bishan Bedi. This yes, was about uh, that was, yes, seven or eight years ago. No, the, the, the idea that uh, there is a whole lot of uh, readership for cricket is not true. You might have one billion cricket fans. These are one billion cricket fans who look at TV and shout and scream. They're not going to go out and buy a book, buy a book. Right. Okay. and and that's and that's a major issue. That's a major issue. Uh, publishers talk about it all the time, and it's they, they, there's some kind of a, a marketing anomaly there. I mean, it's very easy to sell IPL. It's very easy to sell uh, large parts of the the critting, uh, cricketing world to the public, but uh, we are not a book buying public, and it's very difficult. And unless you write, unless you write a book which is full of, uh, which is calling people names and which is full of terrible things that, uh, scandalous things. Because also, don't forget another thing is if if you're writing a biography, let's say of uh, uh, of, of a current cricketer, if you're writing a biography of uh, Virat Kohli, to take an example, there is very little that is not known about Virat Kohli. I mean, from the age of 12, he's been living in the public eye, and it's th there's. Very little, and which means that the writer has to get into Virat's head, which means the writer has to write a completely different kind of a biography. 
And, and publishers are not interested in different kinds of biographies, unfortunately. It was a very good book, Open, right? That was Agassiz's book, yeah. That was read across. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a, that's in fact one of the finer books on sport anywhere. I think it is. A, I, I, it's it's a fu it's a funny question. Because, I mean, it's a it's a funny situation because I personally think yes, but on the other hand, I have also seen what has happened to players who have spoken up. I mean, Sachin Tendulkar, at the peak of his power, at the peak of his popularity, he said he said something about uh, I'm an India I'm an something along the lines of I'm an Indian cricketer first and then a Bombay cricketer. That's all he said. It was, it was almost a throwaway line. And then, and then the Shiv Sena went for him and it became a huge big thing. So all cricketers have decided, for example, that discretion is the better part of valor. We are not going to get into this mess. So to that extent, I, I do understand and I do sympathize. But on the other hand, if a, if a cricketer does speak up, uh, like a young, young boy like Shubman Gill, uh, spoke up about the time when, when the, the farmers were protesting in Delhi. He, he, he tweeted something in support of them. He comes from a, a, a background like that. I think, I think, in my mind, it enhances him as a human being. Uh, you know, so to that extent, yes, but uh, of course, I'm in, I'm in a minority, so, so don't go over what I say. Terrible movie. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I was expecting a terrible movie and I was not disappointed. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, at, at one point, I mean, okay, I, 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 I kind of forgive for the sake of, I mean, you're, you're making a movie to make money, etc., etc., etc. So you're fiddling with, uh, but at least get the, at least get the fundamentals right. There's a, there's a, there's a, a scene in the movie where Kapil Dev hits a six and the umpire cheers. <laughs> you could have avoided that, I'm sure. Gosh, really? I seen the film. Really? I didn't see that. How about commentators? You know, there's a time in the middle of the controversy, like for example, Sanjay Mandrekar or Arshad Hoshay. Yeah, the thing is, uh, how shall I put it? We've got some of the worst commentators in the world. I, I once wrote something about Sunil Gavaskar being a terrible commentator and he didn't speak to me for years. Not only are they bad commentators, they have very thin skins. Yeah. The reason we don't have a good commentator, I mean, I, I, I've seen some of Dinesh Karthik's work recently. I, I saw that he'd done excellent commentary in, in England. Uh, this was before everybody said, what a great commentator. But since everybody has started saying he's, what a great commentator he is, he's suddenly become very self-conscious and he thinks he has to, he has to do and say things that, that uh, are in, are in, uh, are fit into this great commentator concept. So, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He is a very fine commentator. <laughs> but we did have good commentators in the 70s. No. Right? We never had good commentators. Um, I think Anand, I think Anand Settlewar is a very fine commentator. But a whole lot of commentators were, were Especially since uh, people were not watching the game. Oh, I mean, yeah. Bobby Talyar Khan, for example, radio, yeah. he, he, he got away with a lot. He got away with a lot. Yeah. Dickie was very good. Dickie Ratnagar was a professional. Yeah. But uh, people like Bobby Talyar Khan uh, were disastrous. But of course, he's seen as, a fa he's seen as the father of Indian commentary. So now you know what, <laughs> why we have this lot. <laughs> Yeah, some, some, someday. <laughs> I know, I was, I was so shattered. <laughs> it was never a gentleman's game. Cricket, cricket, from from its origins, 
18th, 19th centuries, was a game which was for, for betting. Matches were fixed. Uh, the Earl of Sussex played a, a team of the, uh, with the Earl of Somerset or whatever. And this, this, was, this was an ego trip. So these were the, this was the origin of the game. Of course, later it, it changed. It became more professional. You had, you had an uh, international governing body and all that sort of thing. But this whole concept of cricket being a gentleman's game is, 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 is something that was, uh, I, I, think, I, I don't think is, is, is literally true, no. I think that's fair. I mean, I think that as long as he's consistent, the problem, the problem I have with, with uh, uh, so-called, uh, you know, sportsman-like figures in cricket is that when it suits them, they walk, but when they're in trouble, they stay. And that's, that's something I have, I have an issue with. So I, 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 think, I, think, it's, I, I think cricket is, is large enough to, the sport is large enough to accept all types, you know, temperaments, whatever. And I think, I think it'll, 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 it'll always be spoken of as this great gentleman's game where, you know, uh, with this glorious historical past, which never existed. We learn to live with that. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoyed Lagan. It's 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 a work of fiction. It's a it's a work of fiction, and and you know the director is uh, at liberty to as as long as he portrays things with integrity and and a certain amount of honesty. I have no question. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. The problem with eighty three is that we know exactly what happened. It's it's a historical it's a historical movie. It's not a documentary. It's a historical movie, and when you do that, when you do that, and you and you have these terrible stereotypes. Krishnamachari Srikanth goes to this house of, uh, of, uh, of a Brahmin Tamil family and wants to, ma or, or the daughter wants to marry him. I mean, these are, these are, these are cliches, these are cliches within cliches within cliches, you know, and, and it's, it's quite painful. I'm, 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 a, it's, I'm surprised that I sat through the whole thing, but I, I, I thought maybe, you know, if I was ever asked a question, I, I'd be prepared. <laughs> Oh, it must have. I'm sure it has. It, it, it must have, yes. It was, it was great fun. I mean, I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful place to be. I attended 4% classes and they wouldn't give me my hall ticket, which was wonderful. But I made a lot of friends who, who are very good, very dear friends, even now. Yeah, of course, it was, it was, it was an important and terrific, terrific, uh, whatever, five years. We are done. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.